The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. Something that Pope Francis has talked a lot about and has called our consciences to accountability for is the sins of omission. Everybody should not give a dime to all of these bad bishops. Make sure that all of your money goes directly into the hands of good orders and good activities, but never throw it into a general pot. I think Bishop Shippu and Morlino were absolutely right to call for the Senate to be canceled, but unfortunately it plowed ahead. This has to be renewed in seminary life because of the dominant culture, which doesn't recognize chastity any more than it recognizes charity. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKaig of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, Christmas is almost upon us. It's inevitable that we're thinking about things like babies uh, and birth and the miracle of the Word becoming flesh even the sanctity and the dignity of the human body. Now, you might be thinking, oh, I know, Father's going to talk about theology of the body. Yay! Well, not exactly. We're going to do something a little bit different. As Professor of Philosophy and Theology, I'm happy to talk about the theology of the body. What we're going to talk about today is the biology of the theology of the body. And it turns out that cutting-edge science is in harmony both with common sense understandings of what it means to be male and female and is in harmony with what the church has always taught about male, female, and sexuality. Our guest is a member of the Pontifical Academy of the Family. She's on the faculty of the John Paul II Institute and is the founder of Project Rachel, a post-abortion healing ministry. Vicki Thorne, welcome to The Catholic Current. Well, thank you, Father. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, friends, I, w- I was pleased to be able to meet Vicki for the first time. We spoke in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia back in October uh, on a conference the Archdiocese sponsored regarding uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae, the Church's teaching regarding contraception. And Vicki made a presentation, and I told it to a lot of my medical friends, and they said, oh my goodness, I've never heard of this stuff before. And I think I will be astounded if you don't learn something in, in today's presentation. Uh, Vicki, Theology of the Body, in, in brief, is a recognition that God has inscribed his own wisdom and a revelation of himself in the very human form of us as male and female. And we un- once we understand how male and female interact and complement each other on a symbolic level, we can begin to learn more about the nature of God and his purposes for human nature. And again, as someone who's trained in metaphysics and sacramental theology, I'm happy to talk about sign, symbol, and sacrament till the cows come home. But you're going to lead us into the weeds, so to speak, regarding okay. biology. Uh, g- get us started. Where do you, what, how should we begin this conversation about the biology of the theology of the body? You know, I think what we want to recognize, Father, is that God made us, all right, with bodies, all right, body, mind, spirit, and that everything we do is, in some fashion, all those things are together. We live in a society now where we have sort of come to believe, and this is a gross generalization, but that it's all in our brain. You know, you talk to Mm -hmm. teenagers, well, sex doesn't matter because I don't intend it to mean anything wrong excuse me your body's in the dance here okay but i think that we need to reclaim that integrity of our of our body mind and spirit as god made us and to really appreciate it i I find i do this this talk and and we're picking pieces of it today obviously but on college campuses and in high schools and those young people understand in a way they didn't before Hmm. And they'll come two, three, four times. They'll come up to me and say, hey, I've heard this talk three times. I'm like, why? Why do you keep coming back? And they say, because I hear something different every time. The first time I got stuck on whatever piece, you know, of information captured them. And then they come back because they know they missed some stuff. 
And I, I've run into young people giving this talk to other young people. Um, I've, I was wow. on a college campus, and this young man came up to me before, and he said, hey, you know, thank you so much. I've heard this talk four times. And I asked him the question, you know, why? And he said, because I hear something new every time. Well, when I'm leaving the talk, I'm walking across this little bridge with two women. Here is this young man giving my talk to another young man on the other side of the bridge. Hey. How about that? <laughs> See, yeah. that, that's when, I mean, as, as someone who teaches public speaking and rhetoric, when, when you know they're handing on your talk, then, then you know you've, you've, uh, you've hit home. And I think one of the reasons why uh, this catches on, it's not just because, gee whiz, isn't this amazing, but it's something that we recognize at, at the deepest level of our being, that God mm-hmm. made us, and therefore there's something good about us. And the thing that's astounding is that we get to share in God's creative power powers by virtue of us being male and female. And and mm-hmm. these are things that theology of the body and even a philosopher's approach to the body can talk about at, at length. Let, let's begin to talk about how um, biology harmonizes with theology. And we'll talk about it at length in, in, the, in the later segment, but also about how uh, the, the the modern world, the the present reigning paradigm, is a- actually out of harmony with the human body and human dignity. Oh yes, in so many ways, Father. And you know, we have come to think as a society uh, that we're in control of everything. Right. Um, that you know, we can use we can use pills to prevent pregnancy. Well, then if a pregnancy happens, it wasn't planned. We need an abortion. Um, and then that leads to greater pain because now we may have infertility. So now maybe we have to look at surrogacy or some of the other things that are out there that are just off the off the chart right. in terms of that. And it's an important thing for us to recapture, I think, the awe that's there. You know, one of the things I want to say is that, you know, St. John Paul II, in preparing to write the theology of the body, um, understood and looked at all the science that was available at the time. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know that. Um, he really, he really consumed that, and then from that, he wrote this incredible document. And hmm. and and it, I was surprised to find that out. But it's it's solid information that he really looked at what was there. Now again, what was known then compared to what was known now, you know, it was just sort of a drop in the bucket by comparison. Right. But, right. You know, even in his philosophy, theology, um, in his brilliance, he he understood that we had to understand how God made us because this is a, this is a united entity, you know, not not separated into different parts. Right. We're, we're not just a bag of nerve endings and appetites waiting no. to be tickled and fed, and we're not just right. angels temporarily wearing a, a meat suit, so to speak. We, yeah. we are one composite being together. And I think the sickness of our present culture is that we're in rebellion against the wonderful truth that we're creatures of God and therefore mm-hmm. accountable to God, which is why I think we're in, in rebellion against it. So, for example, uh, re- regarding abortion, the lie is is that, oh, if you're pregnant you don't want to be, you can either take a pill or undergo a procedure and then presto change, all of a sudden you're unpregnant and you're back to the way you were before pregnancy. Now, I've heard you say that's not how it works. Can, can you fill us in on that? I sure can, because really that's my life has been spent talking about that. Um, my my interest in this whole area of abortion aftermath came about just to take a moment. As a high school student, when I was in a girls' high school, it was a day student boarding school, and my sophomore year, a young girl came in, or excuse me, junior year came in, and she was a boarding student, I was a day student, and she became my little sister. All right. Um, only child, you know, I pick, I pick up little sisters if I can. They're wonderful. But anyway, her mother arranged for her to have an abortion between her mm. sophomore and junior year. Now, she had gotten pregnant, and abortion was not legal yet, but it was available. And her mother went mm-hmm. to the big city and arranged for it. And my friend just crashed and burned. And what I discovered after the fact is that she had already had a pregnancy, placed that child for, for adoption, and then got pregnant again. Now, it turns out that there was incest in the family, and her brother was oh. the father of the second baby, and my guess is he was the father of the first baby. And her mother had attended this school, you know, many years before, and that's, I think, in an attempt to protect her daughter, sent her there. 
okay? But mm-hmm. at that point, we didn't know anything about abortion in terms of what it did to people. Um, right. You know, it wasn't legal, but it was readily available. And mm-hmm. and I will say also, you know, as a heads up for people, people think it started with Roe v. Wade. That is such a lie. Abortion has been in the culture for a very long time, okay? Right. Um, when I first started the, the working in the pro-life office in this diocese of Milwaukee, and I started Project Rachel, there was a woman, who, older woman, um, and old enough to be my grandmother, actually, and she said, Vicki, anything you need, I'll do it for you. Okay, all right. Didn't know any story about her, any background. And it, eventually it turned out that she had had an abortion mm. as a young woman, and it came back around when she was getting ready to die. Her, one of her kids called me and said, Vicki, can you, can you come see Mother? You know, she's got some questions, and you know what happened, okay? We don't talk about it, you know, we allude to it. And mm-hmm. so I went to see her, and she said, you know, I, you know, I've been to confession. I found another woman. We, we did some healing together, but I'm getting ready to die, and I got some serious questions. And mm-hmm. I was also able to find a confessor who could, you know, assure her. She'd been to confession. She'd done right. everything that needed to be done. But that really changed my life, those two, my friend and then this friend, okay? okay? So it was to me, okay, this isn't a young woman's issue. This is an any woman's issue. Can't. You know, it, it's b- being pregnant any time in one's life leaves a mark on, on the whole person. And later we'll talk about how it affects a, a couple as well. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation on bi- the biology of the theology of the body. And we will want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us at one 511 5483 Text us the same number, one 511 5483 After the show, go to our website, the Station of the Cross to download the audio as a podcast or pick us up on any of the major platforms iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify Stay with us, we'll be right back The Liturgy of the Hours is prayed three times a day on the Station of the Cross at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. It is the daily prayer of the Church, prayed throughout the world by priests, religious, and laity. For details about each hour or more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. Users of iCatholic Radio are leaving inspiring reviews in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Emilia says, iCatholic Radio is the only radio station I listen to. It's my constant companion whether I'm in my car or walking. It's a good way to learn and to deepen my understanding about my faith. It's a source of reliable information of which we badly need in our culture. I encourage everyone to listen and support iCatholic Radio as a gateway to heaven. Another reviewer writes, at last, a radio station worth listening to. Thank you, I love it. And Deepak writes, a Catholic media treasure trove, spiritually uplifting and fun. One reviewer says, love it, love it. I'm learning so much about the Catholic faith, it makes me seriously consider conversion. If you haven't reviewed iCatholic Radio yet, we'd love to hear from you. Visit our page at the iTunes or Google Play Store. As we remember the Christ child this time of year, consider growing deeper in your faith by listening to our powerful network-produced programs, available as free podcasts through our website and mobile app. Be uplifted in your faith and inspired to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on our iCatholic Radio mobile app. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion. So make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at the station of the cross.com 
Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is one you might not have heard of before the biology of the theology of the body. Our guest is Vicki Thorne, a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, faculty member of the John Paul II Institute, and founder of Project Rachel, an apostolate for post-abortion healing. At the top of the hour, we began our conversation about the biology that underlies the theology of the body from John Paul that so many uh, are familiar with. In this segment, we're going to look at how biology is in harmony with theology. Uh, Vicki, I want to make a statement, and then you can use both sides of the paper if necessary to respond to it. Uh, God wants us to be monogamous. Discuss. Well, I, because God made us that way. <laughs> okay, okay, tell, tell us, I, and I, I can give the philosophical body. reasons for it and the <laughs> theological reasons. What's the biology underneath it? See, the biology underneath it is that, that again, we are so awesomely made. And for us women, okay, when we are not contracepting, we are attracted to a man by scent whose immune system is a complement to ours. That means the possibility of healthy children. All right. Now, mm-hmm. for men, they're, they're, we, we aren't quite sure about the same sort of um, that immune system attraction, but we do know it's there with women. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the problem, if I am on the pill, you know, to just sort of lay out a problem in the middle of the des- description here, is I pick the wrong man. Now, he can be a very good man, and many times he is. He's very much like my father or my brother in terms of, of the biology and the personality because my body thinks it's pregnant when it's mm-hmm. on, or on contraceptives. All right? I'm looking for a totally different type of person. And we're not told that, okay? And, no. you know, about, I just found this interesting statistic, and I'm sure, you know, you know all statistics run, but one of them said that 80% of divorces are, are begun with women. Now, right, if, I've I have made the, yeah, if I've made the wrong choice, and this man now smells bad to me, and that's the only way I can describe it. That's how people describe it. He smells bad. The intimacy is dead. It's gone mm-hmm. away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then what? And we live in a society where, uh, you know, divorce is the easy answer to everything. So we've got those those pieces there. Men don't realize this question. And I've said to people who do marriage prep, one of the things you need to ask is, is she on the pill? Because if Mm -hmm. she is, and this is a serious relationship, she needs to go off the pill for a while and find find out if he is still on a physical level attractive to her. Right. Well, who talks about that? Nobody talks about that. Okay. (laughs) Um, But the importance of recognizing that men are also in this dance. And, and, you know, we live in a society where men have been blown off, uh, for want of a better term, okay, highly unscientific. Um, Well, you know, it's a woman's body. If she's pregnant, you know, once the baby comes, he can be a father. What we don't realize is that men, by four weeks into the pregnancy, know by scent that we're pregnant. He knows we're pregnant before we know we're pregnant, and his body starts changing. And throughout the pregnancy, he undergoes all kinds of different hormonal shifts, but the first one is that his cortisol goes up, and we go, oh, that's stress. No, that's protection. Right. And it's God gives him this knowledge to be a protector early on, okay? And and so we, again, dismiss men in terms of this, but, you know, the men who've lost their children to abortion are a mess, a major yes. mess. Yes, and, we're not know, allowed to we, talk about that. Oh, we can't, no, no, but we will. No. Um, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> that's never gotten in my way before, Father. Um, right. but, but that awareness of he's, he's part of this, and as he gets closer to the birth process, his testosterone drops, all kinds of other chemistries move around, and he gets the nursing hormone for at least six weeks. It makes him gentler, kinder, nicer. And in that first pregnancy, assuming it's completed, his testosterone never again goes as high as it was when he was a bachelor. He went from being, this is anthropological stuff, but from being, you know, a hunter to being a protector provider. To being a protector. Because now he's involved in a system that can't afford him to take uh, reckless risks. Uh, Let's shift from a different angle. You know, I mean, I've taught medical ethics, and I can tell people nightmare stories about uh, sexually transmitted infections 
infections and diseases. But on, on a, even if we put the disease issue in parentheses, what does promiscuity do to, to the human body and, and to fertility? Well, you know, one of the things that happens is that we women absorb seminal fluid from our partner for 15 hours. Now, we're going to assume we are not using a condom here, that right. we you know, either had unprotected sex or we're using hormonal contraceptives mm-hmm. of some kind. But for 15 hours, I am physiologically absorbing the chemistry. Now, why is that a big deal? Because seminal fluid is the richest fluid in the human body. There are 30 to 50, it depends on how you count them, but there's 30 to 50 different compounds in there. And they mm-hmm. include prostaglandins, 13 kinds, um, and, you know, and other female hormones. Huh, mm-hmm. how, what? <laughs> female hormones in, 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 in males? Yes, indeed, because mm-hmm. we absorb that. And that's part of how our body transitions to making our partner you know, to recognizing our partner. If I have married, it takes six months for my body to make the full adaptation to the sperm and the seminal fluid of my partner. Now, I can get pregnant before that, okay? But there's this ongoing recognition that this is this is my this is my partner okay and oftentimes you know that first pregnancy if it comes early sometimes has some complications okay Mm -hmm. that might be related to this because the body didn't make the full the full adaptation Mm -hmm. well if i have multiple partners we keep starting and stopping this process and we may not even get to the six month period okay i'm i'm picking up you know stray guys or guys are you know picking up stray women and that changes the whole thing. And men, there's, there's bonding hormones here in terms of the male's connection to the female, all right? Right. Well, we're, he's, he gets to the point, and again, this is some you know, science that people have written about, but where he's numb. This, this bond, this, this biochemical bond that needs to happen can no longer happen because it got worn out. For want of a better right, the, the promiscuity makes him a, a thrill seeker rather than someone yeah, who's yeah. oriented towards binding. Yeah. So, so the right. fantasy that well, you know, you're young, so you can sow your wild oats and settle down later. Oh, yeah. No, the the sowing of the wild oats means you, you're you're drilling. You're, you're I was about to mix metaphors on the air, and I won't do that. Yeah, uh, okay. The sowing of the wild oats is going to harm your ability right. to, uh, to 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 pair bond and and to be bond. faithful. Yeah. Uh, Vicky, when I heard you're, you're talking Philadelphia in, in October, what I found especially fascinating was that women carry in the bodies of of every child they've ever conceived. Mm-hmm. Can you Self tell us some more about that, please? Yeah. yeah, it's it's a phenomena called microchimerism, and. The child gives cells to us. You know, now we have to remember that in the old days there was an assumption that there was a brick wall um, between the mother's body and the placenta. All right? right, that's been proven to be a super highway. What's in the mother's body goes to the baby. All right, right. but vice versa. All right. So by four weeks into the pregnancy, and I mean that's really early, we are now carrying cells of this child, and they're called microchimeric cells, and they morph in our bodies into different cells. So we may have brain cells from our children, we may have pancreas cells, whatever, okay? Um, It's interesting that these cells, in certain circumstances, if my partner is the proper partner that I alluded to before, all right, um, Mm -hmm. these cells will gather if I have something like cancer, like they're trying to fix it. And this is ongoing research. This is, you know, this is in no way finished, but, but they're finding that this is very interesting. And also that the women who have the male partners who aren't the good match, they end up sometimes with autoimmune diseases, all right, which might, again, speculation on the part of researchers, might be caused by this too similar, okay, of a, of a match here. What right. happens, and this is speculation, um, I've had multiple partners, all right, mm-hmm. and I was on the pill for a long time. Well, mm-hmm. I'm carrying cells from from those men in terms of some of this chemistry here. And if I conceive children, which might have been aborted or miscarried early, I've got footprints in my body in a very real way from these previous partners. Um, right. That's that's a really serious serious question. And furthermore, as children, all right, we carry the cells of all the children who preceded us in the womb same cells, right? Uh-huh. Um, probably not as many as our mothers, but they're there. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, what happens now? Mom, mom had, a, had a child, you know, that wasn't born with partner number one. She had another one with partner number two. I am now the child, perhaps, of the marriage. 
but I'm still carrying cells from people I'm not related to and or half related to okay half siblings question mark what might that be doing in terms again we have an epidemic of autoimmune diseases going on in our right. cultures okay right. with no good explanation i mean people just keep scratching their heads but question mark might that be the case and it's interesting because i've had the experience of people actually someone in our extended family um one of one of someone in the family had had an abortion. Told one of my daughters about it. Right, and um, at one point she was sharing this with another family member, and it, she, he, she hadn't told him about the abortion. She was just talking to him, and he said, "You know, I always thought I was supposed to have a big brother." And she said, "You do," and told him the story. Oh. And that young man wept from the depth of his soul, Father. He just of wept course. and wept and wept. Of and course. The sad, the sad thing is that his mom is still unhealed after all these years, all right? Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of familial um, judgment, okay? Her father, she grew up in a Christian family, not a Catholic family, but a Christian family, and she got pregnant. Her father arranged for the abortion. She got an infection. You know, he brought her home and said, no, you know, this will never happen again. Her sister wrote in her diary today, so-and-so killed her baby. Um, when she when she married into our family, her brother, who was a pastor, sent her an email. Uh, well, in those days, it was a, a note <laughs> that said, mm -hmm. be sure to tell your husband what kind of woman you are. Oh. Um, that, oh. that additional pain, okay, right. still carries right. through with her. And it, it just it just hurts my heart because after all so these years... Th so there's a psychic residue from being yep. pregnant, you know, you know, whether the, the, the pregnancy ended happily or not. But there, right. there, there's right. also, uh, there, there's, a, there's a physical residue. So in other mm -hmm. words, uh, an abortion, for example, doesn't make you unpregnant. It, no, doesn't, it doesn't make you childless because that child... No. Is, is with you uh, at a fundamental biological right. level. Is, am I understanding right. you correctly? You're right. Yes, that's absolutely right. And so, but we don't talk about that. Okay. And again, what is what? What do the abortion providers say? Oh, no problem. It's all done. It's finished. No, no. Every pregnancy leaves its mark in our body, as, in a very real way. That's the significance of being a mother. I think I, God built that there, okay? And, you know, older women whose children die, um, you know, to be able to say to them, you know, you still carry cells from that child. They'll get tears in their eyes, Father. And sure. Say, I do? I had no sure. idea. And, and that may be a consolation for uh, women who've miscarried also. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Vicki Thorne from the Pontifical Academy for Life about the biology of the theology of the body. And we want you to be part of the conversation. Call us now at one 511 5483 Text us the same number, one 511 5483 When we come back, we're going to talk about gender difference and gender confusion. After the show, download the audio as a podcast, for either from our website or from any of the major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Do you ever wonder where God is in your suffering or what His will is for you as you struggle in the faith? Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, a program to inspire you and offer solutions to many of life's challenges. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun and convert from Judaism whose humor and holiness, along with years of theological training, bless all who are in need of encouragement and practical advice. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate or on our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. That's Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. Prayer of Deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg Thee through the intercession and help of the Archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. 
from every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time for Sermons for Everyday Living, a program that brings you real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Visit thestationofthecross.com for details. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is the biology of the theology of the body. Our expert guest is Vicki Thorne, member of the Pontifical Academy for Life and faculty member for the John Paul II Institute and the founder of Project Rachel, an apostolate for post-abortion healing. So far, we've been talking about how biology is in harmony with theology. God made us male and female for a reason. And we want to uh, add, Vicki, before we take up the thread of our conversation again, we got a text from Gregory who wrote, and here I quote, Holy cow, this is an extremely enlightening show. Is there reading material that reflects these truths that is readily available? Yes, there is, Greg. We look at our website about a half hour after the show, and you're going to see our resources list so that you can uh, share this amazing good news uh, with your friend. Uh, Vicki, I want to tell you a story. I read a couple of weeks ago that on the floor of the Australian Parliament, there was a pro-life member of Parliament speaking about abortion, and he was told to shut up. But he had nothing to say about abortion because he was a man and only women can speak with authority about abortion. The next day he got on the floor of the parliament and announced, today I identify as a woman and then talked about abortion. So I I need to send him a Christmas card. But here's my question. Uh, It's not that easy, is it? You you can't just announce on, you know, on odd number days I identify as as one sex and on even number days I identify as another sex. Beyond the, the very obvious plumbing, what are some fundamental differences between me, male and female, and what does that mean for us? Well, you know, one of the things, Father, is that if you, you know, when you look at brain scans and you look at the, the, the science of, you know, brain development, blah, 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 you see that the brains are wired differently, all right, mm-hmm. and that the, there are certain things that are in different places. For instance, and this is very cursory, but women, women have language and emotion next to each other around the brain, both sides, mm-hmm. left and right, okay? Which means that for the most part, women emote very easily, all right? We can just at the drop of a hat. And women sometimes get really annoyed with their husbands because their husbands cannot emote at the drop of a hat, and they don't understand why. Well, in the male brain, the, 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 the area where that emotion lies is on the left side, and it's, and it's near the amygdala. It's not in that, that higher functioning part. So for a man to be able to emote, he has to start, take time to think about it, okay? He's got to go think about it. Then he can retract it, retrieve it, and then he can talk about it. That's one of those pieces. The difference is in what happens in our brain because of male hormones versus female hormones are, are really significant. Um, you know, the, the process in terms of how the, the brain develops, even in terms of timing. And, you know, we don't even talk about this. This is something I learned not long ago, and I wish I'd known it sooner with raising my children. But, um, you know, from age, age 11 to 19, our brains are in a total state of flux, and the higher functioning part of our brain, the rational, logical part, is being rewired. It's not working well, okay? And, and that's how God made us. All right. Right. And then from from 19 to 25, that there's a whole other part of the the brain where the left and right brain connect and talk to each other. Now in men, it's described as a country road. As women, in women, it's described as a you know super highway. But again, it's process driven. 
Okay, that's right. God made us differently. And for us to be conscious of that is very important. Okay, and the society has gotten more and more, oh, I don't even have the right word for it. You know, anything goes. What is there? There are 50 kinds of different sexual orientations now or something. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you would need an app to, to, keep, uh, to keep on yeah, track of do. that. Right, yeah. and you know, even if you put a wig on, it doesn't change the nature of the brain and the skull upon no. which the wig rests. Vicky, and yeah, I, I heard you give right. a talk where you you said you you tried to give your daughters trucks and your boys yeah. dolls. What happened next? Oh, that was an interesting little thing because they both, they you know, the girls the girls fed the trucks, um, mm-hmm. gave them naps. Um, did the sort of things you might normally do with dolls, and and the boys took the dolls out in the backyard and played football with them, and they lasted yeah, a week maybe, yeah, not very long, but that ability to recognize that we 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 handle those things differently, all right, but also to recognize that it's normal for a child to experiment with with some of this, okay. Um, right. You know, our boys at one tw- time decided they wanted to try on their sisters' dresses. It did not make them more feminine, all right? Um, they were kind of like, nah, you can't play football on this, all right? <laughs> and off they right. go, all right? Um, but, but that awareness, that that's part of the questioning, you know, who am I, how am I made, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But but we get so stuck in this. I mean, you see these pieces now, the article, there was an article not long ago about this baby was born. I don't remember what country it was, but the parents are not going to announce a sex because this child will get to pick the sex when it's old enough to do that. Excuse me, at what age are you old enough to do this? Okay, I mean, you've got plumbing, you've got other assorted things going on here, hormones, right. brain development, and and that piece. And parents have become so hypersensitized. And I, you know, I blame this on the media, quite honestly. All right, mm-hmm. that if my little if my little girl says she wants to be a boy, oh, I, I have to do something about it. Well, you know, I think parents need to be aware that until we're twenty five, that brain isn't finished. Okay, for us, right. we're really imposing then upon that child. Uh, the child has no idea what it means to be the, you know, what, what's it going to mean for me to become a boy if I'm a girl? Yeah. Surgery, medication, right. um, fertility loss. Uh, what, four-year-olds are going to understand that? They I, I, I want to go, go back to what you said about developing adolescent brains, because I, I have a, a, a lot of friends who, uh, they, they stay exasperated for, for several years, usually during the adolescence of their children. Yes, they They're in a state of constant <laughs> exasperation. And you have, I think, what was it, six kids? Yes. Uh, yeah, and and twelve grandchildren and fourteen. Uh, now there are two on the way. Um, oh no, no, but, no, twenty. No, yeah, we're twelve with two on the way. Yep. We're okay, with two on the way. Yep. Uh, well, yep. how many times did you say to your teenager, "What were you thinking?" And they looked at you blankly. <laughs> I have no idea of the count, Father. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that doesn't mean that the kid is bad, right? No. Or, no, or no. disobedient. His no, just well, brain is in transition. Yeah, their brain is in transition. And, you know, right. we need to recognize as, as mothers and fathers of sons that boys can only follow one command at a time. All right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're very, the male brain, uh, for the most part, is very linear. All right. Well, I can remember giving my sons, you know, two, three, you know, commands and then going, why didn't you finish them? You know, and then later I discovered this about the brain and went, duh. Okay, well, all right, that explains that. Um, and and the importance of of that recognition um, of, of these, these, these brains work differently. And girls' brains have a lot more connectors because in the old days, the guys were out hunting and the, girl, and the women were in the village running the family, the food, the whole nine yards. So their, their survival of their children and themselves depended on this ability to think you know, more broadly. And right. it, for us to, to really appreciate that differential and to know, there's, there's this wonderful book, and I apologize, I cannot remember the uh, author's name at this moment, but it's called The Primal Teen. And I buy this for parents uh, whose kids are hitting, head, you know, heading into those teen years because mm-hmm. it was the most informative book for me in terms of understanding that that brain is working totally differently. It's a very readable book. Um, okay. And it was written by a scientist who had, you know, a teenager and went, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> but for us as parents to be appreciative of that and to recognize we can't expect those teenagers to be making adult decisions. They don't right. have the capacity to do that. 
Okay, right. whether whether it's sexual decisions, and you know, I'm going to have an abortion. I got sexually involved. You know, for us to talk to our kids about the fact, you know, your brain at this point is undergoing the most massive set of changes it's ever going to happen in your life, and you need to be really conscious of of making decision and, and not using that decision language, but of 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 doing things that that keep you safe. Right. Okay. Vicki, the, the book that you refer to is called The Primal Teen, with the new yep. discoveries about the teenage brain tell us about our kids. It's by Barbara Stroke, and we're going to That's have it. that on our resources list that Please our listeners that. can can check on uh, a, a, after the show. Uh, Vicki, you know, when we talk about uh, male and female differences and we talk about complementarity and so on, uh, we might use the phrase gender binary, that you know, we're, we're either male mm-hmm. or, or we're female. And, uh, and, and in some circles, that's considered fighting words. Uh, and I also know that there is a lot of discussion about kids discovering very early on that they're that they're same sex attracted. Uh, mm-hmm. What would you give as advice to parents if you've got a kid, say twelve, thirteen, fourteen years old, who says, you know, mom, dad, I, you know, I, I think I may be same sex attracted. Uh, there are lots you of know, different I'm, ways of handling that. What, what's your given what you know about the science? How would you handle that? You know, I with gentleness. All right. But, but, you know, I'd explain to them what I was just talking to you about in terms of our brains not being finished yet, mm-hmm. and that this, this isn't a time to be experimenting, all right, um, because that's what the media tells us. You know, well, you experiment with being male, with being female, with same-sex attraction, with whatever. Well, you know, there, even with experimenting with just, you know, regular sexuality, the chances of getting an STD, just for starters, are incredibly right. high, okay? In a room full of people, 18 to 25, who have been sexually active, half of them will already have been infected with some sexually transmitted disease, which might not right. be curable. And we don't, right. we don't talk about that. You know, I think with our kids, we have to be, we choose our language carefully, all right, mm-hmm. but that we're, we're honest with them about their right. development and about what the society says, which is not at all in keeping with what humanity knows, okay? Right. You know, now, because women, the things that you're you're talking about here, um, you don't need a top secret government clearance or a PhD in experimental genetics. No, I mean this is information that is uh, available if you're willing to do a, a little bit of looking for it. And yeah. and you know what what bothers me is there seems to be the common idea that if you're theologically minded or, re- or religiously minded, not only are you stupid, but you're hostile oh, yeah. to science. Oh, you're hostile. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, you know, now you've that, encountered that. that. How do you respond to that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I, when people do not normally take me on after they've heard my talk. All right. Right. Um, I, I had a woman one time who did show up, and she was just absolutely antagonistic, and and then she left quietly. <laughs> huh. um, but and, and it was a public it was a public university that I was speaking right. at. Okay. But but that fact that. We as church maybe haven't done a good enough job, and and and, uh, and knowing this is difficult material, but we haven't, I think, maybe done good en- a, a good enough job in terms of talking about how science supports what the church teaches, and and here's and here are the facts that you know that go with this. You know, did you know that? Did you know that? Oh no. I oh I oh oh I, you know I thought this this you know was thing, you know being married to one person sacramental marriage well I just thought that was you know old fashioned church teaching well no here, right and it was it was meant to be a buzzkill and you know I, I mean yeah. I taught medical ethics for over twenty years and the kids were astounded that the best science tends to line up with the most orthodox theology yeah and I said you'd almost yeah. think there was an intelligent design behind it all. Wouldn't you think so? Yeah, yeah, you would think so. Yeah, they're not two dust bunnies, you know, colliding in space causes. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it is. You just, you, you know, you you listen to some of this stuff and you just scratch your head and say, look, the science goes hand in hand with what the church has taught, and right. how how many through the ages have been scientists in terms of people writing in the church? Right. Okay. Right. They had a science background. Well, not as great as we do now because we didn't right. know all that thing. But, sure. but that respectfulness for how God made us was part right. of of church teaching. 
Right, and I think you know? uh, it can be a right of uh, it can be an occasion of, of justified pride to say, you know, science has now catching up where the church has been all along. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Vicki Thorne of the Pontifical Academy for Life, and we're going to approach the topic just a little bit differently. We're going to talk about the theology of human biology. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Text us the same number, one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. After the show, download the audio as a podcast, either from our website or from most major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. You want to pass this around amongst your friends. This is fascinating stuff. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Franciscan Media's Saint of the Day for December 20th. Today we celebrate Saint Dominic of Silos. Today's saint was born into a peasant family in Spain around the year 1000. As a young boy, Dominic spent time in the fields, welcoming the solitude. When he grew up, he became a Benedictine monk and served in numerous leadership positions. Following a dispute with the king over monastery property, Dominic and two other monks were exiled. They established a new monastery in what at first seemed an unpromising location. Under Dominic's leadership, however, it became one of the most famous houses in Spain, reporting many healings. Wealthy patrons endowed the monastery, allowing Dominic to ransom Christians who'd been taken prisoner by the Moors. About 100 years after his death, in 1073, Dominic appeared to a grieving mother who'd made a pilgrimage to his tomb. He assured the young woman that she would bear another son, which she did. Her son became the Dominic, who founded the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans. From that time until 1931, the abbot's staff used by St. Dominic of Silos was used to bless the Spanish queen and was placed under her bed before childbirth. The new Saint of the Day app is available now for your smartphone or tablet. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. This is Father Jacek Mazur. Please join me in a prayer to St. John of the Cross. Glorious St. John, overflowing with love for Mary and for the cross of her divine Son, obtain for me an unwavering faith and a love of the cross so deep and so valiant that no possible misfortune will ever be able to separate me from the love of my God. Amen. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Shortly after the show, visit our page for the Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. You'll find a link to today's episode page where you can view Father McTague's show resources and today's podcast. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is the biology of the theology of the body. Our guest is Vicki Thorne, a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life on the faculty of the John Paul II Institute and founder of Project Rachel, an apostolate for post-abortion healing. So far, we've been talking about the, the wisdom and miraculous generosity of God in revealing ourselves to ourselves by making us male and female. We've talked about the biology that is in harmony with what the church has always taught. In this last segment, we're going to approach it from a slightly different angle. I want to talk about the theology of human biology, and I want to do that with an awareness that we're getting ready to celebrate the Christmas season. Vicki, when I first heard you present, you said some astonishing things about what it meant for our our Blessed Mother to be the, the Mother of God, the Mother of Jesus of Nazareth. What can you tell us about that? Well, you know, and, it, and, it, and it, it's interesting because I just find this to be the most fascinating stuff, as you said, all right? That's why I talk about it. But, you know, Mary carried the cells of Jesus the rest of her life. 
not only the human, she would have also carried the divine. And that, I think, is what's behind the assumption, all right? But that awareness of, of how closely tied as mothers we are to our children, but Jesus also carried herself, all right? And, and the mitochondria was just from Mary, all right? Um, because for all of us, we carry the mitochondria of our mothers, all right? And how, how phenomenal that whole experience was and how powerful Mary was, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean right. that in recognizing the gifts of her son, you know, mm-hmm. the, the wedding feast, you know, bring, you know, bring, bring the water. No, I don't want to. No. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's a mother's touch. And right. that Jesus had this mother, and in this season of Christmas, for us to be really conscious of the trials that were there also, um, mm-hmm. you know, to be, to be pregnant, um, you know, she should have been stoned. All right. That didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Joseph, Joseph was faithful. And his love right. for her. He, he protected her, yes. He protected her. You know, she went to Elizabeth. That was not an easy journey for a pregnant woman, okay? No. <laughs> we had no cars back then, okay? It was right. either foot or donkey. And, right. you know, she, as woman, woman to woman, was present to Elizabeth in that moment of miracle for Elizabeth in the birth of John. Mm-hmm. And then to, you know, have, have to go off to Nazareth, not to be at home with her women. That's how we gave birth in those days, all right? Right. Um, what, what did that mean for her in terms of her yes? Because I think that that was incredibly powerful. And then, you know, if, if indeed they, you know, they went away for a couple of years because there was, there was danger um, to start again, all of those pieces. And then to be there, at the, at, you know, to behold your dead son. To mm-hmm. see that and to know who Jesus was. I mean, I think Mary's knowledge of Jesus was so profound. All right. Of course. Um, and, and for us to be able to, to really look to that and, and that miracle of new life, but of yes, what is, what is that yes that we say to God in our love and in our, in our acknowledgement of the miracle of birth? It's phenomenal. Well, you know, Vicki, in some translations uh, of the Magnificat, you know, they say, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. But some translations say, my whole being magnifies the Lord. Uh, th- there was a sense that in her body and in her soul, there was a- an alignment with her yes. divine son that that never left. And she carried yep. divinity underneath her heart for nine months. I mean, you right. can't do that and not be affected. Well, you can't. And, and not right. only did she carry divinity under her heart for nine months, she continued to carry divinity through the cells of Jesus in yes. her body. You know, and yes. cause there's, there's no place where God says only, okay, my son is the exception here. You know, right. We're not going to have that happen with Mary. Um, right. That was the, the, the incredible, miraculous gift of that, is, is that, that unity of mother and child. Uh, you know, I just, Vicky, we had an, an earlier conversation where you made reference to molecules of affiliation. Can you refresh my memory on that? Because I think it's relevant to what we're talking about here. Yeah, well, the molecules of affiliation are, are actually scent molecules, all right? Mm-hmm. Um, but but these the cells that I talked about, these microchimeric right. cells, are, mm-hmm. are very real and very present. And, you know, in all of us, if we have, again, if we have older siblings, but if we're mothers, the, the cells of our children remain there. And, mm-hmm. and that's, not, um, that's not an accidental happening, I don't believe, in any way or shape or form. Right. That's God's right. plan, that this connection continues throughout, throughout life. And that can be very comforting to mothers who've had a child die. You know, yes, to be yes, able to of say, course. Well, you know, let me share some science with you that might be comforting. And they get mm-hmm. tears in their eyes and say, yes. thank you so much. I had no idea. Yes. Uh, Vicki, I'm, I'm thinking, too, you know, going back to uh, our, our kind of our Christmas meditation uh, and seeing that, that harmony of body and soul be- between Mary and her, her divine son. Aren't there parallels? We're going to move from biology to theology, so I feel more at home. Aren't there more parallels between the, the human body and soul, and the body, blood, soul, divinity, and Christ in the Eucharist? Don't we begin to approach that kind of intimacy? Oh, I think we do. I think, but, but I also think it's important that we be open to the intimacy, Father, because our yes. society doesn't like intimacy at all. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean, we've, we've really moved away from that. And... Mm-hmm. To hear people preach about it, hear people talk about it, you, you know, talk about it, enlightens people. 
and mm-hmm. it opens their mind and their soul to this possibility. Right. And, you know, I, what happened in the church is that we lost some of this after, you know, with Vatican II, mm-hmm. and we don't pass these things from grandparent to child anymore. We don't know where right. our grandparents are. They live right. far away. Um, you know, faith used to be an intimate part of family connection across generations. Right. And that's well, I, I think part married. of the barrenness of our present culture is there's there's lots of proximity and mm-hmm. there may be lots yep. of copulation, but but there there's no intimacy, there's, there's no, no intimacy. union, yep. there there's no abiding with us. You know that wonderful hymn, reflecting on uh, the encounter with the road to Emmaus. You know, uh, abide with us, fast falls mm-hmm. the eventide, which is lovely mm-hmm. poetry, by the way. But that sense oh, yeah. of uh, God remaining with us at mm-hmm. the level of of body and soul, I think. Human biology points to that Eucharistic presence, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It does. And you know, Father, if you look at the the Eucharistic miracles that mm-hmm. are in existence, that we don't talk about much, but they're incredible. Yes. You know, when when this happens and it's made manifest that this is a heart, this is heart tissue, and that this is this is blood. All right. Um, the miracle of Lanciano is probably the best researched one, but there's a ton of them. All right. Mm-hmm. That, that knowledge of how God works in such miraculous ways um, to speak to his people, to speak to yes. our hearts. Um, and again, that, that is so fitting in this, in this Christmas season of, you know, God's talking to us through, through the gift of a baby, um, that, that holy innocence that's there. But also God's talking to us about Mary and Joseph's commitment to each other, to Jesus, um, yes. You know, Mary Mary was there throughout his life, and that's important for us to also recognize that intimacy of that. And she knew her son. She knew it was time, um, you know, for the, at the miracle of, you know, of wine, you know, water and wine. She knew it was his time. Vicki Thorne of the Pontifical Academy for Life, thank you for being a very fine and illuminating guest on The Catholic Current. I hope we can have you on the air again soon. Oh, anytime, Father. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current. Join us Monday through Friday, 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern. Tune in tomorrow when we're going to discuss uh, the book Confessions of a Traditional Catholic with its author, Matthew Arnold. After the show, go to, the, go to our website, thestationofthecross.com, to download the audio, check out our reading list, and our audio will be available as podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may God, our Lord, protect you from all harm and every evil. Name the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.